Hello again, fellow audiophiles. I am Wave Theory, and welcome to episode three of this new series where I talk about what gear I use, either for my own personal listening enjoyment or as reference pieces for review work. And honestly, those two categories very often overlap, okay? Today's video is going to be about the venerable Hi-Fi Man Susvara, which is a 6,000 US dollar MSRP, full size, around the ear, open back, planar magnetic headphone. It is Hi-Fi Man's flagship in their non-electrostatic line of headphones, in their planar line right here. And the quick disclaimer on this one is, first of all, I reviewed a Susvara way back in the fall of 2021. And for context, it is late April 2023 when I film this video. All right, and so I will link to that review down below. And back then, I called the Susvara the most natural sounding headphone I had ever heard. Um, and so, and then I have also, you know, reviewed a lot of headphones, even very high end and top of the line kinds of headphones on this channel. And I just always thought that the Susvara was the king. And so at some point in this, about a year or so into the life of this channel, I rolled the dice and I reached out to hi -Fi Men and said, look, I know I have reviewed the Susvara already. You don't need to send me one, but I do think it is still the reference can you send me one so that I can use it as that reference? And they very graciously said, okay, and here it is. So I have now had this in-house for uh, getting close-ish to nine, 10 months, I wanna say, uh, maybe not quite that long, but several months now, I've um, listened to it a lot. I have used it as a reference piece to evaluate a lot of source gear. I have used it as a reference piece to evaluate a lot of the high-end and top-of-the-line headphones that have come in since it, it returned and all of that. So today we revisit, I revisit, the Hi-Fi Man Susvara. So let's do shameless self-promotion and then we will come back on the other side and I will explain why this is one of my reference headphones. Hey, thanks for watching this video. Please remember to hit that like button, and if you haven't, please subscribe. Also, I have a Patreon set up so that you can help support me on a monthly basis, and I've set up a PayPal donation so that you can help me out in that way too if a monthly dis a subscription does not make sense for you. Links for all of that, including the benefits, in the description below. Please check those out. All right, on with the show. So Svara has been hi fi Men's planar magnetic flagship headphone since its release back in the year 2017. So this getting close to now to the, the middle of 2023, uh, it's been around and on the market for about six years. Now, the, uh, the unit that I reviewed back in the fall of 2023, or excuse me, 2021, was uh, a loan from a friend of the channel. And it also had the two and a half millimeter inputs on the cup here for the cable entry. This one is a newer version. So at some point in the six years, hi fi has launched, has run multiple batches of these, manufactured several of them. And they at some point changed to three and a half millimeter connections um, on the cups here. So this is one of the newer units uh, to go along with that. I have heard rumors that there are slight differences in sound between the 2.5 millimeter and the 3.5 millimeter versions. There might be just a little bit of truth in that, but I didn't have both side by side to do a direct comparison, so I cannot confirm that. Okay, um, the differences that are claimed is that the three and a half millimeter is just a little bit more neutral, with just a little bit more mid-range presence to it, where the two and a half millimeter is just a little bit warmer okay, in its uh, presentation. And again, that might be true. I just cannot confirm that because I haven't had the two in here next to each other. And I do think that it was that Susvara review, which is uh, one of the reasons why eventually Hi-Fi Man did approach me in the interim there. After that Susvara review, after I reviewed their Aria Stealth Edition and that sort of thing, they uh, approached me and asked if I wanted to do reviews for them because even back then, before they, they and I had any kind of professional relationship, I was beginning to realize that at their various price points, they were the all-around top dog performers. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to like them the best of all of the headphone options at the various price points, but I do say that to these ears, 
at a variety of price points, they are the all-around top performers, and this one still, to my ear, is no exception on that here in the top-of-the-line headphone space. So let's unpack why I still think that. And I will also dive into a little bit like the drivability of this thing because this is notoriously hard to drive with around a, uh, a 60 ohms, like I can't remember exactly, it's somewhere around between like 60 and 64 ohm impedance with about an 83 decibel per milliwatt sensitivity. I'm going from memory there, I forgot to look that up, but it's right in that neighborhood. If I'm severely wrong, I will correct that in a pinned comment down below, okay? Um, it is notoriously hard to drive, so I want to, uh, now that I've had a, a chance to listen to this on a wide variety of headphone amps, I want to uh, uh, say some words on the drivability of this here too. Now, before we get to that, I do want to make a comment on the build, because again, this is a 6000 US dollar MSRP unit, and it looks okay, right? It's got that industrial kind of Spartan look. It's, it's very simple and elegant looking, I think. Now, it does just feel a little bit splashy in the build quality. Like this rotating motion here is A, it is silent, like no creaking or squeaking here, okay? Or anything like that, but it does of course, it's not doing it now on camera, okay? But it does turn really easily. Um, if I set it down on a table, it will like flop over, okay? Which for $6,000, I mean, I would have preferred just a little bit more resistance in these motions without the squeaking, okay? But that is, all right, not a huge complaint, just is. Now, these three and a half millimeter in cable inputs here, they are kind of loose. They, they don't seem to snap the cable in there very, uh, very snugly. Um, let me just illustrate that. I have one of hi -Fi Min's weird like catheter cables, okay, that comes stock with Susvara. You know, this weird with the surgical tubing thing going on. They just feel weird, okay? I'm gonna plug this in here, and I just want you to listen to the sound of this snapping in place. I'll hold it right up next to the microphone. Okay, there I just pushed it in. Now I will pull it out. Do it one more time. Okay, by feel, there is just not a ton of resistance going on there. Okay, it just kind of goes in and out. You know, there is resistance, but not a lot. Contrast that with this. This is my, you know, $200 Bayer Dynamic DT880 600 ohm that I uh, bought aftermarket three and a half millimeter jacks for and did a wire, a uh, removable cable, dual entry cable mod on my own with just like generic cheap 3.5 millimeter jacks that I got, you know, like a 10 pack for $6 or something like that from Amazon. Just listen to this difference. Again, with hi fi and stock cable. Okay, push it in here, pull it out. Do you hear a difference? There is a much more satisfying resistive snap here than there is on the Susvara. So that is another little build quality quirk that uh, I think should be pointed out on their, their stuff here, which I think they could do a little bit better on a $6,000 piece for. Now, you might think that doesn't matter a whole lot. Like what, what's the big deal with that? This being a $6,000 headphone, it is very, very common to buy aftermarket cables, especially since these uh, catheter cables that come with hi fi -Man headphones there. I mean, I call them catheter cables as a joke, okay, because we have this, you know, medical tubing. I mean, do you hear this? That just isn't right, okay? Um, like, uh, everyone basically buys aftermarket cables. You get into the $6,000 space here, and people will buy expensive aftermarket cables, and some of those aftermarket cables will get thick and heavy, right? So the loose connection there means that if you have a really thick, heavy headphone cable hanging off the bottom of this, 
then you can get like a little bit looser connection in there. It'll just, it'll wiggle, it'll wobble. You can get little tiny gaps between the conductors inside there. And if you know anything about little tiny gaps between conductors carrying an electric charge, that induces some capacitance. And capacitance is something that is not necessarily great for audio transmission, particularly in the low end, because capacitors do capacitor things at lower frequencies, which is one reason why we tend to use capacitors in high pass filters because they usually kind of filter out low end signals, okay, lower frequency signals. So that is something that you need to think about and uh, have some mitigation steps for it. If you use a big heavy cable, you might want to think about ways to like support the weight either by, you know, running the cable around your neck, making sure it's on the table, or you just use this in a recliner laying back so that the weight of the cable is on your chest and not on the headphone. Point is, you have to think about that much more so with these jacks than you do with something like this, which is just dirt cheap in comparison to the $6,000 Susvara. Okay. Moving on from that, let's talk about the sound then and why I think it is still a reference piece. And I will just tell you straight up here that after hearing a ton of challengers to this thing, Abyss 1266 Phi TC, okay? Uh, Abyss Diana Phi, uh, what else is in there? LCD5, Focal Utopia, both the original and the 2022 version, okay? Uh, Final D8000 Pro, um, DCA Stealth and DCA Expanse. What else? Okay, um, I'm sure there are some in there that I am forgetting. Oh, RAL SR1A. Um, and then even on the electrostatic side, Odyssey Carbon, Stax 009S, Stax SRX 9000. Okay, um, even Hi Fi Men's own Shangri La Junior electrostatic system. All of those, I still think this headphone, even from my Vioelectric HPA V281 amp, which is not known to be the best amplifier for this headphone, but even with that, this is still the most natural listening experience that I have gotten from any of those, save maybe the Hi-Fi Man Shangri-La Senior, the big daddy, okay? The one that's like $18,000 for just the headset, $50,000 if you buy that with its matching energizer. That's the only piece that I think has created an overall more natural, real, convincing sound than this one. So why do I keep this as my reference? Because I still think that outside of that really fringe case of the Shangri-La that at least these ears have heard, it is still the most natural, organic, lifelike, believable headphone on the market right now, even six years after its launch and even with a lot of new challengers coming in. Okay, so that to me, like, it's just the all-around champion because of that. Its spatial presentation still is like, it's not e enormous in soundstage size, like hi fi and Zone HE1000 series. So this is the SE, that is the V2 Stealth, but at least the SE, for example, and the, the HE1000 V2 non-stealth edition, which was my reference for a, quite a while, like throw a bigger, more expansive sound stage. This one is not super far behind those. It's just not as grandiose, but it still is more real, believable, and natural in its imaging and its separation. Like it is still like almost eerily holographic in the way it places things in that sound stage, which again, isn't as enormous or as grandiose as these, but it's not tiny, it's not tiny, okay? Um, so that to me is still like the way it positions things is just so real and believable that it's the reference, right? Um, the tonality on it and the, the tonal balance, okay? Those are two different terms for basically the same thing. Contributes a lot to that real, believable, natural sound. Okay, like it just has a very smart, realistic tuning where the relationships between fundamental frequencies and the overtones and harmonics of those frequencies just sounds very natural and well balanced throughout the whole frequency range, the whole frequency range. Okay, um, so the mid range in particular just sounds really natural and real and believable to me. 
Now, to go along with the excellent overall timbre is that the timing aspects, like the attacks and the decays, again, real, natural, believable, okay? Um, that's, you're going to hear that coming up a lot, just like just the, 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 the realness here, the organicness, the naturalness is just still top dog out there. Um, again, even with my amplifier that is not known to be the ideal amplifier for this thing, it still bests all of those others that I've, I've heard like in, the, in that cat category. So that is really impressive to me. Okay. Um, now, one thing that it is not super good at is like low end impact slam, that sort of thing. Um, it's not poor. But hi fi men in general is just not known for being, you know, hard hitters. So it's not going to slap your head around, okay? Thump you around like uh, an abyss will do, okay? It's not going to do that like um, a focal or a pause text or an odyssey to some extent can do. But again, it's not poor. To me, who likes that sort of trait, there's still a nice, satisfying thump, hit, slam, punch, whatever you want to call it, macrodynamic physicality, okay? Um, that does scale some with amplifier quality, which we'll get to in a minute, but it's capable of, of delivering, you know, a fairly satisfying punch to it. I think you do need to match that to source gear a bit. So, I mean, one of the reasons why I still use my Berkeley uh, Alpha Series 2 and my Vio V281 amp is that for the price as I was able to get them, this they, they do a fairly good job of helping the SUS, helping the HE1000 SE uh, and other Hi-Fi mins, which I really like, uh, be a little bit more macrodynamically impactful and physical in their presentation. All right, one of the other stars of the Sonic show here is that the low level detail retrieval on this headphone is stellar. Now the detail retrieval resolution on this thing is already st stellar and just, again, the king, top dog of non-electrostatic headphones and even bests a great many electrostatic headphones that I have heard anywhere near the price of this thing. Um, so the, the, the texturing on the sound, like bass texturing and all that, room reverbs, just, just everything is resolved beautifully. But what I mean by low level detail retrieval is you don't have to get this thing particularly loud to get all those details. There are many headphones out there that are splendidly resolving, but you don't really know it until you really crank up the volume and get like north of 75 decibel average sound pressure levels, which starts to get uncomfortably loud for me. Like most of my critical listening is like between 72, 73, 74, for maybe 75 dB av kind of in there, but I tend to stick in the lower half of the 70s of a dB average in terms of when I do critical listening stuff. And some headphones just become more resolving the louder you get because those micro details and all that kind of come out more. This one, it's all there at even lower levels, which not every headphone can do. So that's another thing that I appreciate about it. But then that detail presentation, beating a dead horse here, I realize, the detail retrieval on this is not forced. It is not forward. It's also not pulled, you know, laid back to emphasize smoothness or, or relaxedness or anything like that. It's just so detail. It's just so organic, natural, real sounding. Okay. Is it as good as real life? No, of course not. But as far as like head, the world of headphones goes, it's just way, way up there. All right. So, um, <clears throat> I say that it's detail retrieval presentation there is like its resolution is in service to sounding natural. Not every headphone I can say that about. There are many out there where the detail retrieval is just in service to sounding amazing in its detail retrieval and saying, here's all the details. This one's just going for realism, which I really appreciate. Okay. Now let's circle back around a little bit and talk about the drivability. As I mentioned, I wanted to get into there because again, around 60 ohm impedance, about 83 decibel per milliwatt sensitivity. That is a bit of an unusual uh, impedance for a planar headphone. This one, uh, I think the Abyss Diana TC is similar in its impedance. It might be even yet a little bit lower sensitivity. Anyway, it's around in there. And I want to say the final D8000 Pro is like in the 60 ohm impedance range as well, though I think a little bit more sensitive. No, I know a little more sensitive than this one is. Okay, 
So it is an unusual load on an amplifier because of that. And that's where a lot of the difficulty of driving it comes from. Now it's impedance is fairly flat because it's a planar magnetic headphone. So it doesn't really increase or decrease with frequency a lot like, like a dynamic driver headphone will do. So it's more of a current load, but because that 60 ish ohm impedance is a little, is starting to get just a little bit high, just a little bit. There's also a need for some voltage uh, in there too, even though that voltage is a bit constant. So it's just a bit of a different and kind of a strange load to put on a lot of amplifiers. So what do you need here to drive this thing? You do need current. You do need, you know, some ability to get uh, a, a voltage difference, even though it's, again, it's a little bit more constant there. Let's talk about what power means from an electronics standpoint and a circuit design build standpoint. Power electric power is the ability to deliver electrical energy in a given amount of time. So if you can deliver the same amount of energy in less time, you get more power. Or if you can deliver the same, a, a greater amount of energy in the same amount of time, you get more power. Where the, the power hungriness of this headphone really shows up is in that detail retrieval that I was just talking about. And then wringing the last bit out of that extremely holographic spatial presentation. The tricky part about this headphone is that it is always nice and sweet. If there's a problem in your signal chain, it's not going to freak out. It's going to very gently just kind of tap you on the shoulder and just, you know, kind of do that thing where it's like, hey, have you put on a couple of pounds lately? looking just a little bit full okay where it can deliver some uncomfortable news just does it in a very polite sweet way contrast that with like a focal utopia and i'll get back to this because the, the utopia will get one of these reviews like when there's a problem in your signal chain with the focal utopia it will scream at you put down the fork you lardo okay it is just not nice about signal chain things where this one is just a lot more laid back and sweet when there's a problem in there. So it can be tricky. And I think that honestly, a lot of you are not going to like to hear this. Okay. Sometimes the truth hurts. That tricks a lot of people. They put this thing on a topping A90 or an A90D, for example, and it sounds pretty good. It still sounds pretty good on that amp. I mean, as good as a topping can sound anyway. And it's but it's not there, right? The decays are not quite present. Now that part of that's just the topping delivery, but another part of it is it's just the decay is even less present on the Susvara than it would be for a load that's a little bit easier for the A90 series, okay? Also, that spatial presentation just gets a little soft and mushy and not quite as well defined. And it's not just a topping problem, like my Lake People G111 Mark II is an excellent mid-fi headphone amplifier. Sounds amazing, but this is just a little bit too much for it. And it comes out not necessarily in the bass slam, although that can get a little bit sloppier too when it's uh, when this is underpowered. But to me, like it just sounds a little bit softer. That micro detail retrieval isn't quite there. That spatial presentation just is a little bit like more blended together and mushy and that sort of thing. So. It is in that, it is in that softness and just the not ringing out the last bit of what this thing is truly capable of, which is what happens when it is underpowered. So does it require a lot of power? Yes, but it's not necessarily about just the raw number of output watts per channel. You know, if it's three watts per channel output, five watts, eight watts, 16 watts per channel, or you plug this into a 100 watt per channel speaker amp or whatever the case may be, although you're not gonna get a speaker amp that does 100 watt output at 60 ohms, but that's another story, right? What, what I'm saying here is that it's in the ability to deliver those energy changes that I just mentioned in a very short amount of time. That's where that micro resolution, those little tiny subtle details comes out. And then overlapping that, that last little bit of subtlety in the spatial presentation, which I do think overlaps a lot with resolution ability is to be able to just to pull out those subtle little details that our brain interprets as like, oh, space between sonic images kind of a thing, right? Okay. 
that low level detail uh, retrieval and all of that. Like that's the stuff that goes. It still sounds nice. It still has a pleasing tonality to it. It still has a nice full sound to it. So I do think that some people, they, you know, they just think that, oh, it doesn't require as much power as you think it does. Yeah, it does though, it does. Because to get that, that last bit out, you need it, okay? Um, so th those are my thoughts on that there. Anyway. Let's wrap this up. Hi Feynman Susvara, still the all-around king at the top of the of the line. Heard a bunch of challengers. I keep coming back to it. I have another one around. Like I, I um, traded my HE1000 V2 plus a little bit of cash for a an original Focal Utopia, which is hanging up over there, and it will get one of these videos probably next because that's the only other top of the line headphone that convinced me that um, that other than this one needed to get some time on my head. And I will unpack why that is but uh, in that video, but still overall, this is the one that I reach for more. This is the one that is more believable and natural and real sounding, and to me that's important. And then of course that drivability and its ability to just pull out really subtle differences in signal chains in a nice way makes it a really valuable reference piece for me when evaluating gear. All right. I'm Wave Theory. Thanks for watching. Please remember to like this video, subscribe, leave a link or leave a comment down below. Check out my PayPal, my Patreon. Do those things you do to support uh, YouTube channels. Thanks again for watching and enjoy the music.